In Joshua, remember, Joshua has taken the position of a leader after Moses has died. And God has called for Joshua to lead his nation, God's nation, into battle. Not that it is going to be something which they might find defeat. So long as they're faithful to God, they will always find the victory. And so God has promised them this land. God has shown them the way to this land. And here they are. They finally reached the promised land. But they're not going to receive it just any old easy way. They have to fight and conquer the land and drive out the pagan nations. And I think about Joshua chapter 5. On the eve of battle, here's Joshua. And the first foe is Jericho. And it's, it's before this great fight. Joshua is near Jericho. And I just want you to think about these words. When Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, a man was standing before him with his drawn sword in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said, Are you for us? Or for our adversaries. I want you to notice this individual's response. He said, no. He said, no, but I am the commander of the army of the Lord. Now I have come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshipped and said to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? I think about this passage and I think about what Joshua is encountering here. Joshua is encountering the commander of the army of God. You know, I think about with our Christian walk, we might feel like Joshua. When we come across someone, we might think, well, wait, hold on. Are you for us? Are you on my side? Or are you on the side of the enemy? But in this case, in this instance, this commander said, I'm on neither It's not a matter of whether or not God is on your side. The question is, are you on God's side? And that is what we're reading about. That is what we're studying about. That is what we're discussing this month. Is this idea of spiritual warfare, of this understanding that it is not this battle that is just for me, but is a battle for the soul of all those who love God. That this is God's fight. This is God's army. It's not Jason Campbell's army. It's not just Jason Campbell's war. It is the war between what is good and what is evil. Now, there are a lot of individuals that teach that at the end of time, there truly will be a a war that breaks out between evil and and what is good. And that's not what we read in Scripture. Rather, the, the battle right now is over the hearts and the souls of every person. And what we need to understand is, it's not whether or not God is with us. Are we with God? And we see this call to arms in the book of Ephesians. See, in Ephesians, we see Paul writing to the church at Ephesus, and he has so many wonderful things to say, but in this letter, Paul affirmed a spiritual truth. The faithful Christian can be sure, the faithful Christian can be sure that he will be involved in spiritual warfare. Now, you think about the first three chapters and then the latter three chapters. See, the first three chapters, we read of the doctrinal truths. See, in chapter 1, we see that every spiritual blessing comes through Jesus Christ. In chapter 2, we read about how, yes, we were in sin, and when we were in sin, we were dead to God, dead to Christ, but thanks be to God through His grace and mercy, we've been raised up to be alongside Jesus Christ. For it is by faith that we're saved, and not of the works of man, lest anyone should boast. And then as we move on, chapter 1 is about the spiritual blessings. Chapter 2 is about being raised with Christ. Chapter 3 is about the mystery of God being revealed through the church. And how as Paul ends chapter 3, he talks about how God is able to do beyond what we can think or imagine. That is the kind of God we serve. Now we move on from the doctrinal to the practical. In Ephesians chapter 4, Paul wrote that we are called to walk worthy of the calling by which we're called. Chapter 5, we're called to imitate God, that we're to to walk in wisdom and in love and in the light. And of course, in chapter 6, and this is where we'll find our lesson tonight, we are called to be empowered and equipped by the might and strength of God, praying at all times and to be alert in all things, because there is a battle occurring right here, right now. Will we find victory? 
You know, that's, again, that's another question that I think a lot of people throw up in the air. Will God really win the day? Will, will there really be goodness in the land at the end of time? Here's, here's the question that we really need to be asking tonight. We need to understand that God already has the victory. There is never a question, never a moment of doubt that God is going to lose this fight. See, the question is, will you side with the side of victory? What is the decision you are going to make right here and right now? Are you going to serve the world? Are you going to allow yourself to be overwhelmed by the darkness and by the evil one? Are you going to find yourself nothing more but a pawn in evil spiritual work while on this earth? Or are you going to side with God? Are you going to be faithful to Him, loyal to Him, willing to serve for His cause? Because in Jesus Christ, you will have the victory. And this is what boggles the mind is we know the end of the book. We know the end of the story. We understand that God will have the victory and we can have the victory too. And in fact, God has given us everything we need to find victory. And it's in Him. Are we going to follow his path. Are we going to pick up the tools God has given to us? Not so that we can win the victory for ourselves, but that when God brings the victory, we can be a part of that army. That part of the army that cheers, that finds joy, that the evil is vanquished. So as we look tonight, this is what I want us to do. Every, every week this month, we're going to look at this topic of spiritual warfare. Uh, tonight, I want us to look at how God has equipped us for the fight. Next week will be our special presentation, so we're not going to look at it next week. We'll have a special class presentation as we've been doing on the second Sunday evenings. But then the, the class after that, the, the session after that, we're going to look at our enemy. Who is the one who is waging this war against our Father and against us and our souls? and the souls of our friends and our family. And then finally, uh, the last session of the month, we will look at the end of the war. And we will see just how great, how victorious siding with God will be for us. But as we look together tonight, let's go ahead and let's start in Ephesians chapter 6, and let's begin at verse 10. Let's look at this war just a little bit. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm." So as we begin tonight, again, we see this imagery, as I talked about this morning. Throughout Scripture, God uses several different images to present, to reveal the reality of the Christian, lift, the Christian life. We have, again, the, the vine and the branches. We see the one body and Christ Jesus being the head of the church. But here is perhaps the most prevalent form, the most prevalent image of the Christian life, and that is serving as a soldier for the kingdom of God. When John the Baptist came, and he began preaching, and he began clearing the pathway, preparing the pathway for the Lord, this is what he preached, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. When Jesus came down into this world, he had this great sermon. We read about in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5 through chapter 7. He presented the entrance for this kingdom. We call them the Beatitudes. And we see throughout Jesus' ministry, again, He alludes to this kingdom of God and how when He establishes this kingdom, when it comes with power, He will give Peter the keys, the entrance to the kingdom. And when Jesus died, it is His blood which purchased the kingdom. We call it the church. And in Acts chapter 2, when Peter presents his message this message that moves him by the Holy Spirit, 3,000 souls are added to the kingdom. 
This idea of the kingdom, this idea of God's ruling, of God's reign, is all throughout the New Testament. And in fact, we read this passage in Colossians chapter 1, verse 13, when someone says, well, how do I become a part of this kingdom? Well, we look at Acts chapter 2, verse 38, about how we repent and we're baptized for the remission of sins. At that point, when we become a child of God, He being God, delivers us from the domain of darkness. And He transfers us, He moves us from that which was darkness, that which was corrupt, that which is death. And He transfers us over to the kingdom of His beloved Son. And that is when we become a citizen of God's kingdom. But the moment we become a citizen is the moment that we enlist in the army of God. We're called to action. We're called to fight. And this fight, as we read in Ephesians chapter 6, it is not one of the flesh. We'll look at more in just a moment. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3. How Paul wrote that while we do live in the flesh, we do not wage war in the flesh. Rather, this is a spiritual fight. It is something that occurs in the supernatural realm. Our enemy being Satan and all of those who serve his purpose, his subordinates. We'll look at that more in a couple of weeks. But this is the war. Those who follow God and those who reject the light. It is universal as well as individual. It is seen all throughout God's creation as well as the individual heart of a person. And the soul is the ultimate casualty in the war. So we who are Christians, we are called to live a life conformed to the will of God. We're called to live a life which follows the footsteps of Jesus. We're called to live a life which is led by the Holy Spirit. And when we do so, we're able to stand against the evil day and against Satan himself. I think about what Scripture writes and I, or what, what Scripture tells us, what, what the apostles and those who were moved by the Holy Spirit wrote down. I begin to understand that, that the church is not just some social club. It's not a place where we come if we have problems and then we learn how to handle our problems and then we leave until we have problems once again. See, what I read about in Scripture, when I read what Jesus said to His disciples, whenever the disciples became a bit numerous, Jesus always challenged them to the point that many would leave. Jesus wanted His disciples, first of all, to commit to a side. Sides had to be drawn. You cannot ride the fence. In fact, Galatians chapter 5 tells us of this. That the flesh wars against the Spirit, is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit is contrary to the flesh. I can't live a life both in the flesh as well as in the Spirit. It cannot be done. We have to choose a side. And then Jesus, as we're talking about, whenever the disciples became numerous, Jesus would often challenge them to see if they were truly committed to Him. One thought is Luke chapter 14, when Jesus said, you have to count the cost of following me. There are going to be some that come into your life, your own family members, who will challenge your faith. In those moments, you have to side with God. You have to place me, you have to place God as number one. Jesus always told us openly the truth and the consequence of following Him, that we would face rejection, that we would face persecution. On the other hand, Jesus also told us what would happen if we chose to reject Him. In Matthew chapter 16, Jesus said, What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? What What can a man take? What can a man profit? What can he gather in exchange for a soul? But see, we have to count the cost. Too quick we are ready to baptize someone and bring them up out of the water without letting them know the reality of being a soldier of Christ. See, Paul told Timothy on numerous occasions about the spiritual battle. He told Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 18, that he must wage the good warfare. He must fight that good fight. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, Paul told Timothy, you have to, as a soldier of Christ, suffer. You have to suffer as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And then, of course, at the end of 2 Timothy chapter 4, Paul said, I fought the good fight. 
I finished the race. I kept the faith. See, this battle is occurring every single day. As we wage war within our inward person, within our soul, we need to understand that, yes, while it is extremely personal, and yes, while heaven itself is at stake, we do not have to fight this war alone. And I'm not, just, I'm not talking about the fact that we do have our brotherhood, our brothers and sisters in Christ, that we do fight this together. Yes, while that's true, we also have our great commander, God, Jesus Christ. We have the one who is here for us that will never lead us astray, that will never leave us alone, that he will always be by our side and he will give us everything we need to win this fight. We just have to not only understand what God has given us, but we have to commit to using what God has given us. And that's the war. Let's look at some of the equipment. Let's talk about the armor of God. I'm sure... If you've been a part of the church for quite a while, I'm sure you've heard lessons on the armor of God. But it's always important for us to refresh our understanding. Never because we know, we're well familiar, we're well acquainted with a passage that we ever neglect it. Thinking that we know enough, that we never need to be reminded of the fundamentals, the foundation of His truth. And that is absolutely true when it comes to the armor of God. Let's read together, beginning in verse 14. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Now, I want you to think about, we read it earlier, we didn't read it here just now, but we read it at the beginning of the lesson. Two times in three verses, Paul wrote, Therefore, take up the whole armor of God. And again, it's amazing that God has not only brought us into His army, but He's given us the proper tools, the proper equipment to defend ourselves and to wage good warfare. Again, as we looked at in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3, yes, while we are a part of the flesh, and yes, while we walk in the, the, the physical realm, our war is not fought against other nations. It's not fought on foreign soil. Rather, our war, as Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 10, is it's against the strongholds of fortresses of doubt and opposition against the knowledge and calling of God. And therefore, the weapons that God has given us, the armor God has given us, is of the divine to combat those supernatural evils and those supernatural foes. But can you imagine for just a moment, God has given you the proper equipment to wear, to protect yourself, and only going out into the battlefield with about half of it. I mean, can you imagine running up against the enemy, having your shield in your arm, only realizing you left your sword behind? How are you going to fight this war? Can you imagine wearing the breastplate, but then realizing, wait, where's my helmet? What did I do with my helmet? When you forget a piece or a portion of the armor of God, you are vulnerable to the target, to be a target of Satan, of the evil one. So when God lays out through Paul, the writing of Paul, the armor that He has given us, we ought to take it seriously. And we need to commit ourselves to equip ourselves every day. Let's talk about the armor of God. Like the Beatitudes, by the way, if you've ever looked at the Beatitudes, they're rather unconventional. You think about God's spiritual kingdom. You think, well, what is required to be part of God's spiritual kingdom? And then Jesus begins listing, well, you need to be poor in spirit. You need to mourn. You need to be merciful. You need to hunger and thirst righteousness. As you begin reading all these different beatitudes, you think, what kind of kingdom is this? So too is unconventional the armor of God. Let's look together first, list and we're going to go through this quickly. We have the belt of truth. And of course, as we think about the armor of a Roman soldier at this point, that belt would come around and when it was fastened, it not only held the rest of his armor together, but also held all the weapons of his arsenal. I want you to think about the center of the Christian life is the truth found in Jesus Christ. 
It is what holds everything else together. Without the truth of God, nothing else will be effective against this fight. So we need to have in our hearts, in our minds, at the center of our being, God's truth. Because when we have our belt equipped, it demonstrates that we are prepared and we are ready for the fight. And then, of course, the next one as we think about it, and most of these things are pretty easy to to imagine, to picture, is the breastplate of righteousness. Obviously, we know the breastplate was either a, a piece of metal that was molded to the body of a person, or it was a chain link, it might have been even leather. But the purpose of the breastplate was that it protected the vital organs against any kind of onslaught from the enemy. Now, how does Paul describe the breastplate? Righteousness. It is the righteousness that we find in Jesus Christ that we are to wear on our heart. That is only by the righteousness of God that we find through Jesus Christ. He that made Him to be no sin, He made Him sin for us. See, Jesus knew no sin, yet He took on our sins upon His shoulder. So that through Him we might find, we might become righteousness in God. And it is that breastplate of righteousness, of right living, that protects our hearts against the attacks of the wicked one. Now we think about the shoes. And you think about what, what is the purpose of these shoes? The gospel of peace, that doesn't make much sense. In, in the Roman fighting, in the, in the Roman wars, the, the soldiers would often have the, these metal plates and, and these metal shoes, and they not only protected the feet against possible attacks, but if you think about it, if you've ever played baseball or your kids ever play baseball, they don't wear normal shoes, do they? What kind of shoes do they wear? Cleats. cleats. Man, everybody knew that one. I just want to make sure you're awake. So they all wore cleats. Purpose of cleats is that you get firm footing, right? Well, that's what the Roman soldiers had. They would often take nails or bits of metal and have them molded to their shoes. And that way they could be firm when they have their shield and they have their sword so that they can't be easily knocked over whenever they're in the middle of the fight, that they never have unsure footing. Well, where we find our firm foundation is in the good news of the peace God has brought to our lives. I think about the book of Psalms, how that we find this refuge in God. And God tells us to be still and know that He is God. And then when I think about that and I, and I translate it over to the New Testament, I think about how peace is found only in Jesus Christ. That yes, while I was an enemy with God, while I was on the other side fighting Him, it is through Jesus Christ I have peace. I have a stillness of the soul knowing that everything is fine and good and well between God and me. So when I think about going out into the war, into the battlefield, there are moments in my life where it feels like I could lose my footing if it wasn't for the good news of the peace that I have in Jesus Christ. See, because of the peace that I have in God, I can bear any attack because I have a firm foundation. Well, we continue on. Now we think about this shield, and we, most of us know what shields are for. They're for deflecting any kind of, of a bombardment, any kind of sword or spear or arrow that might come our way. And I want you to think about, what is our shield? It is our faith. What is faith? It is our trust, our conviction, our assurance in God. See, whenever I combat, say, temptation, whenever I combat say doubt. Whenever I face the possibility of sin, it is by my faith in God, my trust in God, that I can reject, that I can deflect these attacks. The helmet of salvation. Of course, again, we understand the purpose of the helmet. For against any critical blow that might hit our head and cause severe damage to the point that we can't think straight, that, that, that kills us instantly. What does Paul say protects our mind, protects our thoughts? Again, it is that blessed assurance in the promises of God. When I come across 
evil thinking. When I come across these evil attacks, I can rest assured that my mind is at ease knowing that Christ has given me a home. Finally, as we wrap up the idea of this armor of God, we have the sword of the Spirit. Again, the this, this sword would be a short sword for the Roman soldier, and it was used both as defense and offense. And the soldier would go out and he would hone his skills and he would train endless hours to make the sword a part of his body as an extension of who he was so that he could be fluid and ready to strike in the battlefield. See, this is the only piece of the armor that we have that is both defense and offense. And Paul lays it out. What is the sword of the Spirit? It's the Word of God. I think about how did Jesus combat temptation in Matthew chapter 12, those first 11 verses. Satan three different times, at least in the Gospel of Luke, we read that Satan tempted Jesus all throughout his fasting of the wilderness. But we have three occasions. Every single temptation, Jesus responds with the Word of God. It's not by my talent. It's not by how good I might be. At, at talking or discussing, debating, it all comes down to, do I know the Word of God? Do I understand it? Can you imagine a Roman soldier going out into war, having never picked up his sword before? See, if we're going to be ready to combat the evil and darkness of the day, we have to prepare our hearts and our minds with the Word of God. Appreciate what God's Word is and what it does for us. So we think about the armor. Thinking about the war, we, we understand that God has prepped us. God has given us everything we need. Was that the end of the story? Okay, I have, my, I have my helmet. I have my shoes. I have my sword, my shield. What else do I need? Well, we need to have the right attitude. When I think about this war, when I think about this fight, Paul didn't end his letter with verse 17. Let's read verse 18 together. Praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. As we close tonight, I want us to see the victory. I want us to see what Paul is writing about, what he's trying to convey to us. No Christian can gain victory through this equipment alone. We must have the right mindset. We must have the right attitude in order to overcome the spiritual warfare. Notice the three mindsets that Paul mentions in this letter. First of all, we have to have an attitude of dependency. You know what that means? Every occasion, no matter how big or small the fight, I turn it over to God. Paul wrote praying some of the time, praying most of the time, all the time, praying all the time in the Spirit. That we have a clear conscience, a, a pure faith. When we pray to God, we depend on Him with all things. Again, we look back at the end of Ephesians chapter 3 that God can do everything beyond what we can ask, beyond what we can think or imagine. Why wouldn't we use this powerful tool? Why wouldn't He have this attitude? See, because we often think, perhaps, well, this isn't so big. I can handle this on my own. That's what springs the trap. When we become overwhelmed with sin, when we begin to think even for a moment, we don't need God. We need to have an attitude of dependency. Instead of thinking we can solve our own problems, rather we need to turn them over in prayer. The second thing, the second attitude, an attitude of vigilance. Paul wrote that we need to be alert. Peter wrote the same do you remember in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 8? Be sober, be vigilant, for your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. See, he's on a mission for you. He's on a mission for your soul, and he's continually seeking a way to capture you. I think about when Jesus is in the garden, and he takes his closest followers, and he says, pray for me. And when he goes off and he prays for himself, he comes back and they've fallen asleep. Jesus said in Matthew 26, 41, the spirit is willing, the flesh is weak. 
just because I'm willing doesn't mean I'm going to have victory. Well, I, I had a good thought. I, I had a good motivation that doesn't guarantee victory. We have to be alert, fully prepared at any hour, any moment of the day for Satan to strike. We need to also have an attitude of perseverance. I think about Paul when he said, I finished the race. That's a long race for Paul. You look at where he began, he was persecuting Christians. He was consenting to their death. And you look at the trip he made after his great transformation, his great conversion, how he went to all these pagan nations, how he preached the gospel of Jesus Christ, how he faced rejection, how he, he, he faced this persecution, how at one time he was even stoned, left for dead. It was not an easy path. And it's so easy for us, after a long journey, to quit. The life has become just too difficult. The road just a little too rough. I'm going to turn it in now. I'm going to give up. Paul said you have to persevere. You have to endure. He told the church at Corinth, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. You think about this idea, first of all, be steadfast. That means be firm in your faith. He said be steadfast, immovable. You cannot be shaken. You cannot fall apart, even no matter how difficult the road might be ahead of you. You are planted in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Always abounding. That doesn't mean that you just keep on working for the Lord. That means you keep improving yourself. You go beyond. You exceed expectations. Your cup is overflowing in God's work. Knowing that it's not in vain. Paul said you have to be alert with all perseverance. Finally, we go back to verse 10. Be strong in the Lord. It's not by my strength that I'll be seen through to victory. It's not by my talents, not by my own wisdom, that I'll find a home with God. It's through the strength that I have in Jesus Christ. We do not rely on our own laurels, our own merits, our own talents, our own power. Rather, we stand firm because of what Jesus has done for us. See, Jesus has already guaranteed us the victory. It is in Jesus Christ we have hope. In fact, James wrote that if we stand firm, if we resist the devil, he flees from us. He may look like a lion, but he's going to flee from you. Not because, again, of your own power, but because of the power of God, which will see you through to victory. As we continue on with this theme throughout this month, this, this series is not to intimidate, but it is to inform. We can't neglect the battlefield, the spiritual warfare, the reality of the truth that there is evil in this world and it seeks our souls. We have to be prepared. We have to be alert. We have to wage this war. But we must always keep in our minds 1 John chapter 4, verse 4. You, dear children, little children, you are from God and you have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. When you think about the enemy, the adversary, he can be intimidating. He can be scary. But then you think about the one who resides in you. He is greater than any adversary, any enemy. Jesus Christ reigns supreme. Won't you find victory in him tonight? As we close and we think about this warfare, I ask you this question. How's the fight going for you, Christian soldier? Perhaps you are not a part of the army of God. Perhaps you haven't become a child of God. Understand it is only through Jesus Christ that you find victory. By being baptized for the remission of sins, you are given a clean slate, a new outlook on life. You are a new creation. Everything that you've done in the past, every sin, every mistake is gone. You've been made whole in Jesus Christ. If you are a child of God, if you are a Christian soldier, and perhaps you're a bit too weary, perhaps you can't see the victory that is before you, take those burdens and lay them at God's feet. If you need a prayer tonight, if you need anything at all, come now while we stand and while we sing.